over a period of 10 years, my ex-husband sued me 25 times and I amassed over $500,000 in attorney's fees. Up until this point, I really had believed that just working hard and making a lot of money so that I could pay the attorney's fees to fight the battles was the best defense. But I started to realize that perhaps the opposite was true. Hi, and welcome to the Micro Empires podcast, where we learn how to build small empires for wealth and security, because you don't have to be wealthy to build wealth. I'm Jennifer Grimson. I'm your host. Let's get started. I created this podcast because I found myself with no money, no job, no car, no place to live, and two kids to support twice. The second time, I knew I had to rebuild in a way that would create wealth and security. And I did that creating over $1.4 million in income-producing investments in just a short amount of time. I'm not a financial expert. I'm not a real estate guru, but I am someone who struggled and had to rebuild twice. So today, I'm going to tell you the story of exactly how I got into this predicament in the first place. So way back when I was 21 years old, I met and eventually married my first real boyfriend, And at 29, I found myself with two children in the middle of a divorce. I was living in California at the time, and my husband and I were separated for a year while going through the divorce, and it was very contentious. Ultimately, I was awarded custody of the children and given permission to move back to New Hampshire, where I grew up, where I would have the support of my family and friends and network. Obviously, this is not the outcome that my ex-husband wanted. In order to expedite this process, because even though the courts had deemed that I could go, he did not want to comply with that and had intended to keep suing me, keep me in the court system. So I walked away from any assets that I might have had access to, uh, the house, the business, the car, everything. I just walked away. And to be fair, we had lived in financial chaos, which many people do. So it's not like there were a lot of assets, but arguably, I probably had some assets, certainly at least a car that I could have taken. That allowed me to get out of California and to rebuild my life. And that was very hard to do because I knew that I was kind of putting myself back, but it was what I needed to get the freedom. So it was 1999, and I literally moved back into my childhood home with my mom and with my two kids and three suitcases. If you ever saw the movie Hope Floats, where Sandra Bullock moves back with her mom, it's kind of like that, back into my hometown, literally putting my kids to bed in in the bedroom that I grew up in. I was able to find work and to start to rebuild. And after about a year and a half, my mom, who had 11 acres, subdivided her land and I purchased three acres from her. And then I designed and I started construction on my own home. And this was a really pivotal moment for me. I was really very proud. I had managed to land a sales job that was earning good money, but all of my money was going to attorney's fees because my ex-husband continued to sue me relentlessly. Now, something you may not know about New Hampshire, the New Hampshire motto is live free or die. And they literally, they take that very literal. In New Hampshire, contractors are not actually required to have a contractor's license. So even though I had vetted this builder and had met with his customers, toured his homes, checked his references, I found out about three quarters of the way through the construction that the $70,000 that I had paid him, he had not paid the subs. And therefore, he had just stolen that money. When you're doing a construction of a new home, you're given draws from the bank. The bank examines the house and at what stage that it's in, then it releases the funds. So if the bank were to find out that that money was all gone, they would stop giving me the money and they would stop the construction of the house. So I had to finish the house very quickly. This is all happening in conjunction with carrying ten dollars to $15,000 in attorney's fees every month just to battle my ex-husband. So I found a friend of mine, a neighbor of mine who was a builder, and I just basically begged him to finish the house. And he did so in six weeks. 
And I had strategically planned that one of the things that I could consider was chapter 13 bankruptcy. My ex-husband had not only been suing me, but he also sued at this point, my mother, my brother, and my sister. And he just wasn't going to stop. Chapter 13 bankruptcy automatically puts a stop to all lawsuits. And at the time, it could protect your primary home. So I moved into the house and literally the next day filed for Chapter 13 bankruptcy. Now, I knew that this was going to ruin my credit for 10 years. Not only have bad credit, but no credit. And I had the house and I had stopped the lawsuits against my mother and my brother and my sister and myself. And I felt like this was the smartest move that I could make. Now, about five years after initially moving back to New Hampshire, I got a job with a company in Nashville, Tennessee. I'd also been dating someone down in Nashville for about a year and a half. So I decided to make the leap and I moved to Nashville with my kids and my mom. I rented out the house in New Hampshire and went ahead and took the leap. Well, the bankruptcy had worked for a while, but then the lawsuits continued because I was still continuing to earn money. In all, over a period of 10 years, my ex-husband sued me 25 times and I amassed over $500,000 in attorney's fees. Up until this point, I really had believed that just working hard and making a lot of money so that I could pay the attorney's fees to fight the battles was the best defense. But I started to realize that perhaps the opposite was true. At this point, I had been dating my boyfriend at the time for about three years, and he wanted me to move in with him. And he wanted me to quit my job. He'd been asking me to quit my job for about a year. He had the means to support the kids and I, and he wanted to see me relax. It was a very high pressure job. I worked at least 60 hours a week. I traveled all the time. And it was a lot of stress. And honestly, staying around my kids a lot more sounded really great. But further, it kind of took away that financial motivation for my ex to keep suing me. So I moved in with my boyfriend and I quit my job. I still had another job, sort of a part-time job. And I filed Chapter 13 bankruptcy again. And I did this to escape Yet again, the lawsuits. You know, after a while, I kind of think he got the point that I could just continue to do this every three years. And my credit was already ruined. So it was just kind of a place where I thought I needed to go. And for a while, this tactic, it did stop the lawsuits. Actually, that was probably the end of the lawsuits. But I had jumped into a different fire altogether. At some point, there will be an episode called The Never Ever Evers, but what I had done was I'd moved into a house that was not in my name and was driving a car that was not in my name. And I had no real income. I had a, a very small income from part-time consulting work that I did on the side. The only thing I really did was I had an old 401k with $47,000. And I thought, well, if anything happens, I can at least use that 401k to get back on my feet. The lesson here is to never, ever, ever turn your financial well-being over to another human being. My boyfriend during our relationship had asked for me to take that 401k, he owned his own business, and to roll it over into the 401k of his company. And he asked that I disperse the funds to him and that he would turn it into the 401k within 90 days, which I believe is the limit to do that. So I did. I didn't discover until after we had broken up that he never did roll that into a 401k. He actually had just pocketed the money. So when our relationship eventually ended in 2009, I found myself again with no money, no savings, no job, no car, no place to live, and two kids. And I would have to rebuild again for the second time. But this time I vowed to be smarter and to create small pockets of investments, little micro empires, so I'd never be in this position again. That's the story about how I got into this position twice. And from what I've learned from talking to people, I don't know that it's terribly unique, but it is embarrassing and it's not easy to tell you. I want to share it with you because I want you to understand what the origins were. And here's the thing. I'm not a financially independent multimillionaire, uh, not yet anyway, maybe someday. I'm just a regular person who's doing my best to create wealth Late in life, the second time this happened to me, I was 41 years old, 
and with the tools that I have at hand. So, I mean, I didn't get an inheritance. I didn't get a big settlement from a divorce or anything like that. I had nothing and I had to rebuild from nothing. So the following episodes will detail how I rebuilt and how I ultimately created the micro empires in my life to make income producing investments. I'm still doing this. I'm still learning. And I'm hoping to share with you the path that I'm on and also learn from you and together grow our micro empires. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you would subscribe and review this podcast, it would mean the world to me. It truly is the only way for me to know how I'm doing and what you hear and what you'd like to see in the future. If you want to reach me, you can at a lot of places. My website is www.micro-empires.com. You can email me at jennifer at micro-empires.com. You can call or text 213-973-7206. And of course, you can reach me on social media, on Facebook under my name or Micro Empires. I have a page and a community. You can find me at Twitter and Instagram under my name and of course on LinkedIn. Thanks again, everybody. See you next time.